and Sri Lanka Food Processors Association, SLFBA. I welcome you all to this interactive session. I am Miresha Mendes, current president of IFSTSL. Sri Lanka, our country, is now facing the worst economic crisis ever, affecting the capacity of every sector of the country. The energy crisis resulting from fuel shortages and frequent power cuts affect the production sector, especially the food processing sector, resulting in food shortages, high food prices, and it is predicted that the situation would worsen, leading to severe malnutrition among a high percentage of individuals. Food processing sector requires technology to move into different processing methods. These technology shifts need specially replacing current fuel systems in terms of alternative energy sources, the capacity of operation, size of machinery, equipment, etc. Institute of Food Science and Technology Sri Lanka, IFSTSL, serves as an apex and liaising body to connect all the stakeholder groups in the food sector. And it provides services to uplift, uplift the, the level of professionalism within the food processing sector in the country with the participation of professionals representing academia, food industry, and other line agencies. Serving as a technical arm of Sri Lanka's food a processors association, IFSTSL very closely connect with them in understanding technical and technological needs of the food industry to provide professional services. Considering the current crisis situation, a discussion took place between two organizations to identify possible roles that we could play to support the sector and this interactive session is one such approach and Sri Lanka Food Processors Association supported a lot to connect the food processors in the country to this forum. We took a great effort to identify a good pool of resource personnel to provide insights into processing solutions to face the current crisis situation. Today, there will be two uh, sorry, five speakers in line. Professor Sanat Amaratunga, Dr. Chatal Manak Peruba, Professor Nimal Dharmasena, Engineer Mr. Sunil Basnayaka, Engineer Mr. Kapila Biratunga. Without taking much time, let me introduce the very first speaker, Professor Sana Tamaratunga. Sir, now you are in a position to share the slides while I'm giving you a, uh, I'm giving the introduction of, about you. Professor Sana Tamaratunga is a graduate from the Faculty of Agriculture, University of Peradeniya, specialized in agricultural engineering. He obtained master's and PhD in the field of agricultural process engineering from Kyushu University, Japan from 1991 to 1997. From 2003 to 2006, he served as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, Davis, USA in the field of agriculture process engineering. With his long experience, uh, in, and research in agriculture process engineering. He provides consultancy services to the private sector, food processing companies, and is also engaged in designing food processing equipment and machinery. Professor Sanat Tamaratunga is currently serving as a professor of agricultural process engineering attached to the Department of Agricultural Engineering, Faculty of Agriculture, University of Peradeniya. Professor Sanat, as the very first speaker, I invite you to provide us with insights as to how the current crisis situation affects the food processing sector and to come up with possible 
technological solutions. Over to you, sir. Good morning to you all. Thank you, Professor Iresha. Actually, a few days back, Professor, Professor Iresha gave me a very difficult task, and I thought of uh, uh, sharing uh, my little experience on in this subject. Uh, now, as we all experiencing, starting with the COVID pandemic, uh, all the industries uh, were in trouble. So that uh, we had to time to time uh, adjust uh, into the situation where the country was locked for a long time. And then thereafter, this economic crisis came in. So it, it created a totally I mean, a new situation where we thought uh, basically the, the problem is, uh, sorry, uh, problem is uh, local, right? But uh, it looks like the problem is global so that we are facing uh, uh, a problem where we cannot see the end, right? So if I list the, the current problem that we are facing, especially the food industry, energy, like all the other energy and transport. And second, most importantly, the raw materials, right? So most of the raw materials that we are using for processing food, we import. Even say, uh, if it is chili, 90% of the chili is imported. So that, uh, I mean, uh, uh, most of the, the, the raw materials, we are depend on the, the availability of the dollars. Um, and the local uh, raw materials, of course, there are problems, right? The cleanliness and the, the quality. Right? So these are the, the problems with the raw materials. And the third, of course, not because even with the pandemic or the, the economic crisis, we are having a large problem related to labor issues, the efficiency, and the labor cost. Uh, and even with the, the, the new situation, this is now worse. Uh, we have to pay a huge uh, salary for the labor and they are not working and there are no ethics. So a lot of problems with the labor. So we have to look for technological solutions for this problem also. And the next is the machinery and equipment. We all depend on uh, important machinery. Actually in the past, uh, we cannot make any machine in Sri Lanka because it is very cheap to bring it from China or India. So if that is the case, it is better to bring it here and use it for the industry. But the problem is that technology has not developed in the country. So uh, when this uh, economic crisis came in, uh, none of these uh, industries are in, in, in a position to make uh, the machinery suitable for this high quality food industry. So that is also a problem. The machinery and equipment, and the, the machinery, even uh, it was uh, cheap to buy from the outside um, because of the same reason that industry has not developed. So this is the problem now we are facing when we are going to make machineries here because the, to produce machineries, we need again machineries. So those uh, machineries we do not have the numbers that we require. Uh, the, the technology, yes, of course, again, uh, we could access, we could have access uh, the foreign technologies with, uh, with foreign, I mean, ex expenditure. So to, to access the, the, the knowledge or the people or um, the new uh, developments, now we cannot do it because of the economic crisis. So that we have to think of developing these technologies, um, availability of the technology local. And there the main problem is the industries are basically up to now, they all depend on, mostly depend on the, the, the foreign technologies. They are not rely on basically the local technology. So they are reluctant to use local technology. So uh, there's a problem there in applying local technologies. And the market needs, Right? The market is changing. Market is changing very rapidly. Uh, the, the things that the people bought for their food now changing because of the economic situation, because of the problems with the transport, because of the availability of the food. And uh, because of all these reasons, the market is rapidly changing so that the industry cannot identify 
how it will go for another couple of months or years. Right. The gravity of the problem. We thought this is local when the pandemic came. But little by little, when the economic crisis uh, gained interest, we thought still it is local. But um, the, the global, if you look at the global context now, the, 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 even the developed countries are going on period of recession. So that it affects our economy and it will be long term because of this collective uh, thing. And in this context, there are opportunities also for the food industry. Not like other uh, materials, um, whatever the situation, people should eat. So that there are new opportunities uh, for the food industry too. As an example, in the very near future, we are going to face malnutrition. At least a um, large number of uh, children and the elderly people will suffer malnutrition. So why not uh, producing like say, uh, uh, nutrition bar or some kind of a new invention and which will be I mean, easily marketable and maybe the government might support uh, because it, it is, I mean, we are fighting with the malnutrition. So those opportunities are there. And also in the field of traditional medicine and cosmetics, because a lot of these things are important. And since these medicines are not available, people anyway, we have to rely on uh, traditional medicines. So those sector, because they are also plant-based and they need processing so that uh, the food processors presently facing problem might be uh, worth looking into these opportunities. And also we have a large number of underutilized fruits and vegetables. And in a situation like this, the crisis situation, we are looking for the, 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 the keeping quality or the, to keep it for a long time after processing. So there are a lot of opportunities in processing these underutilized food center vegetables. It will create a large market for them. So, so the prediction of uh, needs. So we need to uh, look into the future of this processing business for food, feed, and mainly import sub substitution. The things that we already imported, we have to produce it here, right? So at least uh, part of it should be substituted so that that industry will prosper. And also the best industry to prosper is the export. As I know, the, the spice industry, they are earning huge amount of money these days exporting these items to other countries. So uh, in this uh, difficult situation, now the, the transport is a major problem. So that in the future, I hope, I think these uh, processing factories will be uh, will emerge in local, in different local uh, uh, places, and it will re reduce the the transport, and um, it will provide the job opportunities for local people, and also the distribution is easy because it is in their vicinity. So these uh, small scale. Um, localized uh, processing facilities will be a reality in the near future. Regarding the energy, we have to look for renewable energy, right? Now, uh, uh, probably uh, all these uh, machines rely on electricity or diesel or fossil fuel. Well, now they are thinking of converting them into um, renewable energy like firewood. Or we have to convert or uh, increasing efficiency of the existing systems and limitations of solar energy and, uh, and changes needed. So the use of solar energy, right, is limited in our in our factories mainly because our our main uh, production lines are designed for utilizing large amount of easily uh, usable energy sources like electricity. Right? Now, when we are converting this into solar, we are facing a problem of the power. Now, to do a job, you, you need to spend energy. But if you spend the energy in a long period of time, then the power requirement will be low. But if you look at a good factory, 
all these wood factories are using uh, processes short term to make those short term processes into solar energy is very difficult. So we have to convert these uh, processes into a long term processes also continuous. So I will show you some of the, the things that we attended uh, in the past might be useful in the in the industry now. Now this is a, a paddy steamer. All these are developed by our postgraduate and the undergraduate students. Now we need a research to find out the time requirement for the uh, power boiling of paddy. It's just two minutes exposure to the steam, less than two minutes. So we developed the steamer where when it comes from the top, from the soaking tank, or going down in the in the pipe like this, we send the steam with a, a regulated rate. Then, uh, with less amount of energy and less amount of labor and less amount of time, we could get the, the product out uh, with a good call. So, mm. and also uh, for drying, we newly built. Uh, uh, firewood uh, dryer, uh, this in Ubudumbara. Now, for, for a dryer, normally we are spending large amount of money for the for the cabinet. But we converted existing room into a dryer where you put firewood into this and the fluid goes through the, the room and the whole room is a dryer. So you can see the right hand side, the trays or the racks. So we can um, put these racks into the, the chamber here for dry. We can raise the temperature even more than 100 degrees Celsius in this room. So that the capacity is like, say, uh, five tons of uh, fresh metal. So these technologies are cheap, very cheap compared to buying a mechanical dryer. So the, 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 uh, the flu tube or the, the exhaust of the dryer. And this is the place where we put I would into the dryer. And now factories are converting their boilers into firewood type. This is one of the examples. This in Purnagala. They had a kerosene oil uh, uh, steam generator. Now they are going to fix this uh, firewood steamer. And also uh, in this crisis situation, the, the technology called heat pump dryers are, uh, I mean, energy efficient and well to use. And as I explained earlier, the electrical usage for drying purpose, the power requirement is very low. Right? This table is a comparison of these technologies, the sun drying, freeze drying, vacuum, or dry drying, and this is the heat pump. So it is 95% efficient, running cost is very low, and other qualities are very good. But if you compare the cost, the sun drying is cheaper, but the problem is the the, the availability, when it is raining, you cannot use it. So also for drying, as I explained earlier, if you make the process slow, then the power requirement is low. This is one of the solutions. If you use a heat pump to dehumidify uh, the, the drying facility, you just put the material in. I mean, with the solar energy, easily we can run this type of a heat pump uh, uh, to dry, say, two, three tons of material. So this is a 12,000 BTU unit. Um, we probably, sorry, we, uh, we made several of these. These are 24,000 units to dry materials in the deep end. These are uh, small units. This is for uh, dehumidifying a room for drying. This can be run with solar. And also, uh, this is also a heat pump uh, drying of chili. For, for, for milling purpose, and also we made a robotic uh, feeding mechanism so that we need a very uh, less amount of labor. Otherwise, we need at least uh, four or five labors to uh, feed the, the dehydrated or dried chili into the mill. So, so the, the local technologies. To focus on raw materials, as I explained earlier, production of uh, raw materials locally and to find out alternatives. And secondly, the packaging. Packaging material is a very big problem now. So we have to think of developing packaging materials locally. 
and use of underutilized food, uh, food materials as raw material. And should develop local technologies for maintenance of the existing systems. Now the systems are there. If, if, if there's a breakdown, it's very hard to find parts. So we have to, I mean, think of maintaining the existing and development of the machineries, right? For this, uh, with the emerging new small scale industries with the crisis, they need small uh, machineries for processing. So entry level processes, there will be large number of entry level processes with this crisis so that we have to provide the technology for them. And establishment of new facilities, small, medium and large scale, because uh, food will be a vital requirement and also uh, the, the industry will grow. Uh, renewable energy use, of course, and increasing the efficiency of existing systems. And also in this crisis situation, I encourage you to collaborate with the universities, research institutes uh, to find uh, solutions for your crisis. Actually, there are now large number of universities in Sri Lanka and also um, technological universities. They are doing a lot of research. Actually, uh, it's a very good uh, sign of uh, development of the technology. And they are doing a lot of research. And if you go to these universities and talk to the, the researchers there, probably you will be able to find solution, solutions to your uh, problems. Actually, as academics, we do not know much of the problems in the industry. If you know the problem, then we can even think of doing some small research and uh, find a solution. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for giving a very clear picture of the current uh, power energy crisis in the country and proposing how we can use local technologies to face the situation. And now I'm opening the floor for questions. If you have any, uh, uh, I mean, want to make any clarifications or giving comments, it's open and there is a, uh, the question already in the, the chat box. Let me read it to you, sir. Uh, what is the difference among conventional hot air circulation dryer, heat pump dryer and vacuum dryer? That's the question, sir. Is it clear to you? What is the difference among conventional hot air circulation dryer, heat pump dryer and vacuum dryer? Sir, you are muted. Yeah, uh, in a con convectional drying, we transfer the heat for evaporation of water to the material by convection so that the the air temperature is high uh, for supplying heat and also we have to heat the air for getting low humidity or drying. But in heat pump drying, we basically we uh, extract the, the water from the, the uh, surrounding air so that the RH goes down and at the same time that energy, that uh, energy for condensation of water will be released again back to the drying chamber for supplying the latent heat of vaporization for the drying. So that it is a very uh, efficient and low temperature drying system which preserves the quality of uh, the dry product. The freeze drying is the third one as I can remember. is an expensive process but the quality of the product is very good. Yeah, any other questions? Uh, if you have any question, you can unmute your mic microphones and ask questions. It's possible now. Even any comments would be entertained. Yeah, well, uh, Professor Resha, my name is Tusit Vijay Singha. And first and foremost, uh, we really appreciate uh, the IFSTL and SLAP is organizing such a uh, timeless webinar for the, the benefit of the industry. Uh, well, my question to Professor is, uh, you mentioned Professor that uh, the raw materials, packaging materials that uh, we should be trying to source it locally. Uh, and also you mentioned the fact that, uh, that we need to improve our shelf lives as well when time to come. So my question to you, of course, as you all as all of us are aware, the raw materials in manufacturing of packaging material, everything is being imported. Even uh, even as you all know, in polythene, even the granules we get import and we do extrude, right? And also so all the packaging material, all the films that we import and we do just we do value addition here only. 
just the converting part. So with, with that background, uh, how do you perceive, how do you think that we can improve, we can do locally uh, because our, our industry is not, have not gone to that level to manufacture anything locally. There is no raw materials at all. Everything has been imported. All what we do is, because actually I'm with that particular background, I'm talking to you because I'm involved with packaging material, uh, we are suppliers basically. So how, how do you, how do you kind of, try, how can you approach this and how can you resolve this issue? Thank you. Actually, um... A uh, lot of research has been done on this uh, part. Only thing is that it was not viable because these uh, cheap plastic materials were available. But now under this uh, crisis situation, those technologies can be very effectively, I mean, we don't have to do any research. Those technologies are there. Even uh, University of Peradeniya, uh, a science faculty developed one product, uh, which is very much similar to the, the granule that you feed into normal extruders. And uh, the physical properties are also same. It's made out of uh, cassava starch and several other ingredients. So it's there. Now we have an institute called Blito, uh, Business Linkage Unit of University of Peraj there. Now they are looking for an uh, in, in investor for producing this in large scale. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Professor, actually, I will get in touch with you. Uh, you're, you're talking about investment in Sri Lanka regarding this kind of uh, the packaging, the material, which is definitely very important. Uh, I'll get in touch with you after the, this webinar. I'll get your contact details from Professor Reza. Thank you so much. Sure, sure. Yeah, sir, there is another question in the chat box. Uh, it is, there is a new technology called desiccant wheel. Does it available in commercial drying process? Yeah, it's available. But there are a lot of problems with the desiccant wheel. Um, I mean, it's basically absorbent. Uh, when, you, when the large wheel rotates inside the drying room, uh, half is inside the room, half is outside the environment. So when this is rotating, uh, moisture gets absorbed into the wheel. And when it is going outside, uh, we need to heat the, the, the absorbent for vaporization of the water, absorbed water. So it will consume large amount of energy. I don't think it's a viable solution to a country like this. So there is one other uh, question. Uh, it is while appreciating your presentation, uh, even uh, laboratory freeze dryers are very expensive. Are they possible to make locally and whether they are available? Actually, uh, we can make it locally. It's a simple gadget. Only thing is that the price of the stainless steel Probably Sunil, uh, Mr. Sunil will uh, I mean, do better answer for this. Otherwise, it's a simple technology. Yeah. Uh, any other questions, clarifications, or comments from the the forum? If not, let me thank uh, Professor Sana Tamaratunga for the for a job well done, sir. Thank you very much. So we'll be moving to the, the second uh, the speaker, Dr. Chatal Mana Peruma. Sir, uh, you can share your slides now. So let me uh, give a, a briefing about Dr. Chatal Mana Peruma. He is a mechanical, agricultural and food engineer. His long career in engineering was spent equally in two countries, starting in Sri Lanka, then in the United States, and finally again in Sri Lanka. He started as an engineer in the paddy marketing board, building rice processing complexes, construction of the Triposha processing plant in Jaila for the Ministry of Health, and the Coedust uh, plant in Nigambu for Ceylon Tobacco Company were some of his achievements. In the United States, he conducted research in rice processing, food freezing, and food packaging. He worked with the food and other industries in U.S. on membrane applications in processing and energy conservation. After returning to Sri Lanka in 2009, he joined the post-harvest group at the University of Peradeniya, a convective solar dryer for grains and controlled environment storage for onions developed during this period 
have found many applications. He also developed and taught a graduate course in renewable energy technologies. With that brief introduction of you, sir, it's over to you. Yeah, as I introduce, I am I'm Jatal Mahanapiru. I am now a visiting fellow in the Faculty of Agriculture. Yeah, what I'm trying to do is, you know, I was uh, in Sri Lanka as an engineer during the previous crisis, uh, which was very much similar, maybe a little uh, less severe in 1970s and into 1980s, and we had the, pretty much the same problems. And uh, my first uh, uh, involvement as an engineer was petty storage and processing complexes in Sri Lanka. I was in charge of the uh, power oil implant and a few things in these complexes. Uh, uh, my second uh, job in Sri Lanka was the reposition production plant at uh, Kapuvatha Jayala. This meets the nutritional needs of uh, pregnant uh, mothers, lactating mothers and children. And this project is still uh, functioning in the midst of the shortage of uh, uh, mess because it also depends on imports for Production, so increasing the production of uh, soybeans and maize will uh, really help uh, to get these uh, uh, factories uh, processing properly again. Third project I was involved in Sri Lanka was uh, to produce coir dust briquettes. Uh, coir dust is the, what is left after extracting fiber from uh, coconut husk. And I was working with Ceylon Tobacco Company, which had a uh, need for, for a fuel for tobacco barn. So we started taking the coir dust, which is too light to be transported, we pressed into briquettes and uh, used it our, in our barns as well as uh, in the boilers in the factory. So I will, uh, so I will get, get back into this a little later. I spent about uh, 25 years in the United States and uh, I came to Sri Lanka in 2009 and I joined the post harvest group. Uh, as the introduction mentioned, I am a mechanical engineer first, agricultural engineer second, and a food engineer third. When I came to Sri Lanka, I decided on working on uh, agricultural engineering post harvest because we can do new things. Uh, food industry typically involves importing machines and uh, installing them, and which didn't interest me much. So we developed the uh, uh, a controlled environment uh, seed onion storage system and this is uh, introduced in 2016 now there are over 70 installations around the country and several in this uh, audience have helped me uh, get this going the second project i uh, did was uh, to introduce a convective solar dryer for drying of paddy because drying paddy was a major problem. So we introduced very low energy consuming, very uh, economical, uh, cost very little to install. So this also has become quite popular. There are over 60 installations countrywide. I worked on several other projects, developed several other dryers and other uh, things, but I am not going to talk all about uh, those things uh, anymore. So I'll move on to the core of the presentation, which is uh, to innovate out of the crisis. A crisis is uh, not a very good thing, uh, but if you are enterprising, you can innovate, uh, innovate things to get out of this crisis. And also for such people, crisis is uh, an opportunity uh, because it gives us, uh, it gives you a time span and uh, the price margin because imports are getting too expensive. So you can uh, innovate to, uh, to substitute imports. And also you can do new products, new processes, and also develop uh, new exports. So that is uh, what we in the food industry can do because at least we have a raw material, the, the products that we grow in uh, local conditions. So one thing I uh, did yesterday was to go back into uh, go to a website and search for what's happening to coconut uh, peat, what what's called the kohubat or coconut fiber dust in Sri Lanka, because I worked on this uh, 40 years ago. So we have a five kilogram uh, 
Uh, copy bail is about is 400 rupees advertised in this website. So this is a picture of that. And uh, what I did was as an engineer, I first look at uh, the heat value of this cocoa peat uh, is about 15 megajoules per kilogram. Unit cost is about uh, rupees 80 per kilogram. So if we divide uh, one from the other, you get the cost of heat, which is 5.33 megajoules uh, rupees per megajoule. On the other then I went to the C, uh, CPEPCO website, the The unit, uh, the heat value of Hana soil is about 40.7 megajoules per liter. Unit cost is about 367 rupees per liter. When you divide one, one by the other, you get 9.07 rupees per megajoules. So what are we doing? We are exporting uh, cocoa peat, which is at rupees 5 rupees, per, which cost about rupees 5 per megajoule, and we import uh, for our soil and use it, which costs rupees uh, 9 per megajoule. So it, this requires rethinking. Uh, should we be exporting this cocoa peat, or should, should we be burning it in our boilers? You have, to, of course, this uh, price difference is not the only thing. Conversion eff efficiencies are di uh, different. Uh, boilers have to be converted. So the, this type of things uh, have to be uh, thought out in the context of the present situation because I, I don't think the oils are going to get cheaper. And so one thing we looked at recently is uh, to using paddy husk as an industrial fuel. Uh, it's used widely and on a large scale in rice mills and sometimes in tea factories uh, also. Uh, but the uh, the problem side is a little difficult to handle and it doesn't burn on any standard furnace. So the step grade furnaces are common, but we developed here recently, this was in the last few months, is a step grade furnace with a very inexpensive automated husk feeder. So, so to people can, you know, don't have to be feeding it all the time. It's, uh, and it's also expected to work at a high efficiency. And uh, the more convenient, this is designed to burn about 20 kilograms of uh, paddy husk per hour, which is about uh, 70 kilowatts. So import substitution uh, for industrial, uh, industrial fuels has several options, the firewood, paddy husk, sawdust, rice straw, forest tea and garden waste. All these things can be used if you have, uh, if you uh, design proper furnaces and also if you make, can make it a little bit more economical to transport. The one, one thing we learned uh, through our experience in the 70s was that uh, we produced this square dust bricket and start, started firing in our boilers. We did it in our company boilers. But any uh, you know outsider who would convert its uh, oil-fired boiler to uh, burn uh, coir dust breakers will or cocoa peat will soon learn that is much cheaper to buy firewood maybe which may be seven or ten rupees a kilogram or or even so dust or maybe paddy has so that you know was not a commercial success so that's even that's why eventually uh, coir dust bricketing uh, went out of the scene and cocoa peat uh, took over the utilization of uh, coir dust. So import substitution of food product, uh, food products is uh, probably the uh, the topic that most of the participants are interested in. Again, even in the case of food products, uh, shortages and high price of imported products allow a price and a time margin for local substitutions. So one. Uh, One product, uh, the one, one uh, the product that comes straight into my mind is the breakfast cereals, because we have uh, plenty of grains, uh, cereals and legumes, so we can process them into uh, breakfast cereals. Breakfast cereal is a very, I think, in very much in need because people don't have the time to cook the string hoppers and uh, kiribat every morning. So I think uh, there is a big market for breakfast cereals. Uh, they can be made with wheat, rice, or maize. Uh, the, Process, uh, process like extrusion, rolling, flaking, and baking are the process that are used. 
exclusion processing is quite uh, popular in Sri Lanka now. It was first introduced by the Triposha program in the 70s. Now there are maybe at least five or six products in the market uh, where grains are extruded. So uh, these technologies uh, can be developed, can be used, and uh, new products can be introduced to substitute for the imported uh, breakfast cereals. Maize is uh, a little bit uh, uh, easier to produce than uh, a paddy because it uses less water and there are several other benefits but in Sri Lanka maize is used mostly as an animal feed. Processing it as human food and uh, using the byproduct of animal is an alternative approach. So two, two products that uh, come to my mind are tortillas and uh, corn grits. I find that uh, Mexican uh, foods are becoming popular in uh, Sri Lanka. There are several restaurants in uh, Kandy, Colombo, and there's one even in Kandy. And the Taco Bell is also an example. So tortilla is uh, made from uh, maize flour and uh, it can be used as a wrapper for sandwiches or it can be also substitute for roti made from uh, wheat flour. And corn grits is another product uh, that is uh, used in some of the industries. And uh, also it can be used as a substitute for rice like uh, couscous. Uh, so these things uh, may have a market uh, in Sri Lanka and they can be produced with the local raw materials. Another raw material that we can use uh, for new processes and new products is beans. Beans is, uh, they grow well under Sri Lankan conditions and also it fixes nitrogen in the soil. So it has uh, a lot of advantages. It could be an intercrop it is. And uh, unfortunately the potential for beans uh, that in general legumes is uh, underutilized and uh, there is a very high potential that is unutilized. And, uh, we will be there to help uh, anyone uh, who is interested in this type of things. So beans uh, can be used as a dal substitute. It's, uh, it's also a legume. And uh, in 70s, uh, in, I remember developing a process uh, to uh, produce a, a very good acceptable dal for, from cowpea when I was at the Vice President Development in the IPHT in Anuradhapura and it was in the market and uh, moong and other legumes are also quite possible uh, as substitute for dal and the process is very simple uh, dehulling and splitting what we used was uh, the attrition mills the split type attrition mills that are made in Sri Lanka and some aspiration and uh, grading and uh, we had the product and by products were uh, used for animal feed. There are other possibilities. We can look at uh, new things, uh, not only dal. The baked soybeans uh, could be a good substitute for baked beans, and it could even be, uh, it, it could definitely be more nutritious. Peanut butter from groundnuts is uh, another alternative uh, because we really don't have all the butter we need. Uh, and peanut butter sandwich is a very popular snack uh, in the United States and many other countries. And the process is very simple. It's, uh, you know, the crux is just grinding it out. Uh, so that uh, pretty much is uh, what I want to uh, present today. And uh, the last list that, you know, the role of these institutes and universities in Sri Lanka and uh, they can, uh, they have a good knowledge base and uh, they can be clearing houses for new innovations and, uh, and new innovations in products as well as processes. And also to put uh, the industry and uh, the universities uh, together because a lot of research is being done in universities, not many people know. And the institutes uh, can uh, play uh, role in uh, coordinating this effort. Thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me and thank you very much for all for participating.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Jatal, for sharing your insights towards the, the possible use of local raw material for potential product development, especially focusing on nutritional needs. Uh, while thanking you, now the, the forum is open for questions or any clarifications or comments. Sir, now you can unshare your uh, the screen. You can unshare your screen. Yes. Any questions? Any comments? Clarifications? Uh, yeah. Can I add one comment? Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jatal, uh, Jatal Mana Perma for your, for your nice presentation. Actually, I would like to add another component into your nutritious list, I think, the Moringa. So the Moringa is available in Sri Lanka and it, is, it has a lot of nutritional factors. So I think uh, uh, when, when people are talking about malnutrition, it is really important to add Moringa into our daily diets. So that also a possible thing uh, uh, with high nutrition. Yeah, thank you, Elmi. I think that's an excellent idea. We should work more on that. Uh, my concern is uh, uh, now these nutrition, the foods are there, how the affordability of the people for this food, the price of the current, uh, the cost of production and that price. So it is about affordable, these products by local and even for export. Dr. Chattal, any answer to his comment? The question was not clear if there was a question. So he's talking about the affordability of these uh, developed uh, food products. That, I mean, is it uh, affordable? For them now, when we use this raw material for product potential food product development, is it af affordable considering the current crisis? Yes, for example, now peanut butter, the kilo of the peanuts and even beans and all very expensive. So is it affordable by the people at the moment? Yeah, I think uh, the, it will be uh, affordable, say, compared to the price of, uh, it's, it, it's how it compares with the uh, price of butter and uh, any other alternatives or cheese. Uh, so I think uh, then, of course, you have to evaluate uh, how much you are paying for different nutrients. I certainly think uh, uh, things like peanut butter, at least some of the products that we can uh, make using the local raw materials and these uh, processes. Some of them would be affordable, uh, uh, not all. Yes, any, any more questions? Yeah, Iresha, just to add one point, uh, uh, I mean, just to help the justification that was made by Dr. Jatal, I have seen that uh, locally produced, I don't know whether it is imported raw materials, there is a price difference of about 400 rupees for uh, imported as well as locally produced peanut butters right at the moment. This is what I have observed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. If there are no uh, questions, uh, let me move to the, the third speaker, third resource person. He is none other than Professor Nimal Dharmasena. Professor Nimal Dharmasena earned his PhD in post-harvest engineering and technology from Cranfield University, UK in 1997. Since then, he has received short-term training from uh, several countries. He's a professional trainer in ergonomics and cleaner production as well. He has served in a number of national and international organizations such as IPHT, CARB, a technical advisory group of the Ministry of Health, and Asia and Pacific Net Net Network for Testing of Agricultural Machinery, ANTAM under UN. His major research focus is on post-harvest engineering and technology and published more than 116 research publications and is a holder of four patents. 
He has also been involved in a number of national and international projects under World Bank, World Food Program, Food and Agriculture Organization, German Technical Organization, India Sri Lanka Foundation, European Commission, World Vision, Chrysalis, etc. Professor Nimal Dharmasena is currently serving as a professor in the Department of Agricultural Engineering, University of Peradeniya. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Iresha. I think uh, my slides are visible right at the moment. Is it? Yes, sir. Yes. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Iresha, for the introduction. Uh, actually, Iresha, uh, Professor Iresha wanted me to speak on the broad topic, that um, the, the, the theme. But since uh, we are in the same team, all the spe speakers, five speakers, I just picked up one particular area. Most of my uh, uh, presentation is based on uh, selected four research outcomes that we have done during the last 15 years. And this is the, the crisis situation is something like this for me. And when someone is using a Mercedes or a BMW, I eight or whatever it is, in a crisis, to go five kilometers, we have to decide whether we are going to use Mercedes-Benz or a bicycle. Both are doing the same. So I, I picked up a topic which is based on a number of telephone calls that I have received in the recent past, uh, especially on brine coconut. I mean, the brine material is coconut. I'm a coconut man, basically. I was born in Kurnagal district. Uh, so due to these reasons, I picked a narrow topic to minimize the overlap between other speakers and uh, the presentation is based on uh, research findings in a narrow area uh, and I will discuss about our experience with research as well as pros and cons that we have experienced in this work. So I will be talking on compatible technologies, drying technologies, some are overlaps with uh, previous presentations as well. So what we have done uh, with uh, this is the comparative study on uh, coconut drying techniques. Sun drying is the most common for the small and medium scale people. Of course, the large scale they have solutions, technical solutions. They can go for high tech. At CERI improved kiln, we work with Coconut Research Institute. Of course, this is also going to work. They are sponsored. And then we develop a new solar hybrid drying system for Cochra. So my first presentation is based on this. It is, it is a MPhil research work for two, three years. Our intention was to produ uh, produce an alternative for the, the, the small and medium enterpri uh, enterprises to use an alternative for direct sun drying. So we just compared the performances. We develop a prototype and we want to dry, dry coconut, fresh kernels with 50% moisture down to about 6 to 8% moisture. You can see the picture. Uh, some of the notes are not clear at the bottom, I guess. Yeah. A study was collaborated with CRI, PGIA, MPhil Research, myself, and Professor Samar Jeeva, Bar Samar Jeeva, supervised this activity. So we just did this uh, traditional technology, uh, developed compatible technology with solar drive. Our design was for about 700 nuts per batch. And I will show the design aspects. I'm not going into technical details. It's, it's, we don't use uh, high-tech approaches for the design. It works on natural conviction. and CRI improved kiln. Of course, this was constructed under the instruction of the Coconut Research Institute. And the part that was uh, very important for any drying application is the step rate furnace. So this, of course, uh, was very popular with Ceylon Tobacco Company. And Professor Jatal has also shown this picture. Although it is old, still people use this technology due to its 
convenience. So we have also developed the same with the help of their staff for these dryers. Technically, of course, we have constructed using normal bricks, just for information of the interested people, maybe a fraction, small medium enterprises. Uh, cast iron bars are available in the market for these step grades and fixing them for natural convection, natural ash removal, and hoppers and other things. We just made it in our workshops. It is very simple, but the furnace efficiency, of course, depends on the designed capacity. If we are running it under capacity, of course, their efficiencies are very low. So we could reach about 78% efficiency uh, when we were feeding about 10 kilograms per hour for the design. Uh, of course, I mean, if you are, it depends on the, the raw material. In this case, we have used paddy husk. Paddy husk, although we have used it during that time, today, of course, it is a question mark. The reason is that whenever I am buying paddy husk charcoal at Peradenia, the cost is cost of charcoal per one kilogram is 150 to 200 rupees. Uh, it was available freely available long years back 10 15 years back but today it is not so we need to look for materials like dr jatal highlighted or or else other biomaterials which are available in the location and then the hybrid dryer so this was i mean this was under testing at that time and we wanted to see we had a lot of hopes on this and there were pros and cons but uh, temperature, of course, we could manage it within the, the required limit, 57 to 67. But the main problem is that solar collector efficiency was very, very low. Although we expected uh, reasonable efficiency from the solar collector, it didn't work. The efficiency of the heat exchanger was acceptable. It was within the, I mean, roughly about 40% under natural convection. And the efficiency of the furnace at the higher feeding rate, as I have shown, it was roughly about 80%. That is also a good efficiency. Um, the drying efficiency, unfortunately, was very, very low under this system. And we ended up with a good quality copra, 73% white copra, that is the, the, the most important in copra industry, and milling grade two and milling grade three was very low. Uh, it was not the best, but it was much better than traditional processing technologies. The improved CRI kiln, we usually fire coconut shells. That is the traditional way of doing it. Nowadays, of course, not nowadays, uh, people use uh, char charcoal powder, charcoal dust. That is much better than firing coconut shells if it is available. The average drying, drying temperature varied. We cannot control it. Not like in the electrical dry, dryers, heat palm dryers, we can control it to the best that we want. 75 degrees plus or minus 18, so that we cannot expect good quality stuff from the kiln. Drying efficiency was a little bit better. It was about 15.5%. But copra, we, we cannot, we could not end up with good quality first grade copra, uh, white copra, because the temperature was exceeding uh, 90 degrees in certain times of the dry operation. You can see some, if you are not familiar, good quality copra, white copra, this has the highest demand. Uh, and then milling grade one, milling grade two, and brown copra, and dusty copra, the moldy copra. Of course, we get it when uh, we get fungal infections. Sun drying, just for a comparison, uh, the surface temperature of the cups, we could not reach more than 46 degrees. So this is a limitation because if we go for sun drying, those who are familiar with, we will end up with aflatoxins. Yes, great problem in this industry. Highest drying efficiency, solar energy is free, renewable. 
out of three systems, of course, efficiency was high. The COPRA processed, we had a bit of trouble in candy because we conducted it in candy due to the bad weather. We could not end up with a lot of white copra. So the, uh, the first grade quality was we ended up with 25. This is very common anywhere if you get rainy weather. So the efficiency is a comparison with respect to sun drying at the highest and then hybrid dryer and the, the uh, Sierra kiln and the solar hybrid lowers. This, this is telling us about the technology and its efficiencies. You have seen that, I mean, some of the slides that Professor Amartunga has shown, if you're going for the higher end dryers, we can reach efficiencies above 90%. But if you are coming down to the compatible technologies for low tech, of course, we, are, we have to have a sacrifice. So we need to select what is the most compatible, especially under crisis situation, whether to run with the bicycle or whether to drive the motor car with limited fuel. And from that research, we thought that we need to try a flatbed. I think uh, Mr. Kapila, engineer Kapila will talk on flatbeds. He is producing commercial types, overcoming some of the limitations that we have faced here. It's a flatbed hybrid type. We, we designed it for 500 knots. Of course, this project was sponsored by uh, Sarode Seeds, Sarode Economic Enterprise Development Services. They wanted to develop this drive for their customers. Then we did work on this. This is also a simple construction. Uh, based on the same systems, we have used separate furnace. At the same time, we just made it very simple by just finding materials, biomaterials we use, but yes, even for this one. Uh, at the base of the drive. At the same time, solar energy is used as a direct solar heating collector, solar drive. You can see that solar collector efficiency was 24%. With respect to the, the hybrid type that we have tested, the, the, the cylinder type, rotary drum type, it had only 4%. This gave us a much better solar collection efficiency. And when we just use the fire feed, like the, the kiln, the heat exchanger efficiency was a bit low, close to 20%. Um, And the temperature, of course, this depends on uh, the burning rate. We have used about 16.5 kilograms dry mass. We could maintain 60 to 70 degrees centigrade for seven hours. There are fluctuations, but I am talking about the average figures. Heat exchanger efficiency at this operation was low, lower than other uh, tested because we, are, we were using only the convection, not uh, the forced air convection. We can modify it and then increase the um, efficiency. But our intention was to give it to the remote people. That's why we have not tested it. But you can see these are the pictures of the product that we have got. We ended up with a very good product. On top of everything, nothing is perfect when you are working on this compatible intermediate technology. The chimney ventilation, although we have designed it, it was not sufficient. Moisture condensation at the beginning of the, the, the dry cycle was a huge problem. So we have no other way other than facilitating it with artificial ventilation to evaporate this moisture. Otherwise, the moisture that is evaporated from the product will fall back onto the crop, which is on the dry bed. Now this slide compares the several methods that we have used for coconut. The time material that we have used is coconut. As I said, I'm interested in coconut. So you can see that kiln drying, we could not end up with white copra. It's not because of the, the temperature, high temperatures. Sun drying, of course, we had limited white copra. The situation is not unique. This depends on the climate that we dry. Rotary drum dryer and flatbed dryer, when we compare, 
the flat bed dryer gave us a much better result. And with respect to the cost, actually this was done a few years back. Um, the costs are not true for today. But if you are looking at the cost, of course, it is not very bad. And the third research work, this was also a master's research study by one of my students. And we did compare the flat plate collectors, the type of glass that we use, type of glass that we use. So we just found that um, two types of glass, pin-headed glass that we use for normal windows. There are specific glasses if you want to get it for dryers, we can we can get it in other countries because they have manufactured. But from among the locally available materials, the plate glass, these are the two common things that we use. We have done a comparative study which glass has a better performance. And she tested paddy, jackfruit, and chili under her study. And then we found that pin headed, there is a bit of hiccup over here, jackfruit drying the efficiency. I don't know why it happened. Uh, but if you are looking at the, the performances of two types of cover plate, the covering glass, you can see that pin-headed glass is a little bit better than plain glass. This is a simple thing that when somebody is designing a collector, solar collector or a direct solar dryer, whatever it is, what type of glass to be selected. For the fourth research is that because there were several co telephone calls from the coconut industry, they were asking about whether they can combine this char or biochar with heat extraction units. CRI developed a gasifier unit uh, to get heat as well as char. And then team of us from Peradinia, we evaluated this in 2013. We have found that we have found that uh, it is not that satisfactory. And then there is another innovator. He is a IT engineer, as I can remember. Uh, he is from uh, Teklave Private Limited in Kurnagala. He has his own estate, and he wanted to develop this alternative energy source for drying coconut, making copra. And right at the moment, he is using charcoal dust, and he is working with a number of students on developing a new biochar uh, and uh, a heat extraction unit. The heat extraction is in the form of hot water or a thermal fluid. I think uh, Mr. Basnaik will talk on this thermal fluid and hot water systems in more detail because he has 20, more than 25 years experience on working on these systems. And it is under development. I checked even it yesterday. Still, it is not completed. So his intention is to commercialize this unit under this crisis situation. So you can see some of the technologies uh, that are compatible. You can select different materials. I just took this example of coconut because I wanted to present my data. The take home message that I want to give you for the session is fuel for thermal power generation should be decided based on available resources. Now, as I said, this um, inventor is working on firewood generated by the coconut tree, coconut branches and all this, but is falling from down from the coconut tree is going to be its source of fuel. It is uh, very in inexpensive for, for his because he has a coconut estate. We have to analyze uh, available technologies if the industries are going to use it. If you are not trying to develop your own economic and technical feasibilities. We can give you a lot of examples and uh, you have to investigate whether these are economically and technically feasible for the industries to fees and these are the most important. Rule of thumb is, if you are using high tech, you will end up with high quality, there is no doubt. But in a crisis, we have to decide what is the level of technology that we need to select. To decide, most compatible solution, take crisis, crisis situation as a challenge and try out your own designs. Be innovative 
and then come up with your own designs that will help all your industries. What I say want to say is nothing is impossible. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you very much, sir, for giving us some insights on the pros and cons of the local technology, uh, specifically targeting the, the coconut industry. So now the, the forum is open for questions, clarifications, or comments. And uh, there is one uh, question in the chat box, sir. Yeah. Uh, how about the drying efficiency in continuous type belt dry? So can you hear me? Yeah, the question is about the drying efficiency in continuous type of belt dryer. Wait a minute. Yeah. We can't see the, the question. Why is that? Sir, I think the, the, the person who, uh, has directly sent it to me. Ah, just right. To read, just to read. Yes. Yeah, the question is about continuous time. Yes, sir. Now the question is about the drying efficiency in continuous type uh, belt dryer. Yeah, I cannot give you uh, an exa exact uh, 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 answer, the efficiency values, but usually the most improved uh, continuous type dryers, uh, depending on the dryer design, Usually they have higher efficiencies than whatever the technologies that I have discussed. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, now you are free to unmute your microphones and ask questions. So you can unshare your, I mean, uh, the slides. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Reja. Yes. Uh, I am not. Uh, we basically we are a TJC mango grower, and also we have uh, vegetables as well. Okay. Uh, we got a dehydrator machine uh, as a uh, uh, from the government. Government. Okay. Uh, install about four months back. Unfortunately, it works on both kerosene and electricity. Due to uh, in our area, kerosene is not available at all. From, from the day we installed, we couldn't run it even for five minutes, even for testing. So uh, I want I want to ask the panel: Is there any other way where we can, if the only if the current situation continues, is there any other way we can uh, convert into some other form of energy? Actually, I think there will be many answers from. Uh... Two other presentations. I mean, it is possible. It is possible, and we, we, our commercial team, uh, the the industry partners. I think uh, Mr. Kapila has his own patented uh, systems on downdraft, and uh, Mr. Basnaike is running his own company on thermal conversions. Definitely, you can find commercial answers rather than just answering yes. Right. Okay. Fine. Iresha, any any yes. possibility of uh, getting the, uh, the contacts and passing on to me? Sure. Sure. We'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure, we'll do that. And thank even uh, Professor Sanat, uh, are you willing to give a uh, answer to that question, sir? I think uh, Kapila and Sunil will. Uh, okay. 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 Then uh, any any other uh, questions? Yes. Sir, there is a question yes, in the chat box. Uh, let me read it. Thanks for your presentation. I noted there is a possibility of uh, harnessing sun uh, energy to obtain superheated uh, steam. Yeah, is yeah. this something that is really possible? Yeah, yes. this, is, this is this is actually possible, uh, and that is going to be very efficient. And this is uh, harvested really well by Israeli uh, uh, technologists. So what we need is that we need to. Uh, we need to improve. Usually, they use used to uh, have these parabolic uh, collectors, and this is possible. And this is one of the, the best areas that we have to invent, especially in uh, develop, uh, getting superheated steam. Uh, sir, uh, Professor Dharmasena, can you unshare your slides, please, sir? Stop share. Yes. Yes. Thank you, sir. 
uh, any other any other questions from the audience okay if not let me uh, read the the briefing about the other speaker mr sunil basnayaka uh, he will not be using any powerpoint slides he'll be talking about his experience practical experience mr sunil basnayaka graduated from the faculty of engineering university of peradeniya and obtained a masters in biosystems engineering from the post graduate institute of agriculture university of peradeniya altogether it counts 30 years of work experience of which 16 years at finlay t estates private limited and 5 years at biofoods private limited he has handled many energy saving projects process restructuring new factory designing among other related services currently he is involved in designing and fabricating food processing machinery mr sunil over to you i think you are muted sir you are muted yes thank you oh. thank you uh, madam for the introduction and uh, welcome uh, everybody to my presentation uh, today i have uh, shortlisted a uh, few of my experience uh, in the food processing industry especially i worked in the tea industry for a long time so i will share most of the tea industry experience uh, if uh, processors who are not from the tea industry will feel uh, odd but keep uh, listening because uh, any point uh, going to discuss here will be very, very useful for you all any disturbance hello yes uh, go ahead mr oh, okay okay uh, basically uh, we uh, analyze in the case so what are the hindrances uh, from the and the contribution that we can give from the engineering side of uh, view for the survival of the industry uh mr sunil you are muted you are muted again is okay now yes okay sorry uh, uh, right right okay so we basically uh, going to discuss uh, the electrical and thermal uh, power uh, saving projects we did uh, for the uh, particular industries and uh, let me start uh, off with the uh, electrical energy uh, saving projects uh, which help a lot to plot for the survival of the industries we work for so first thing what we did was carry out uh, a proper uh, energy audit in our factories which will be very useful uh, we have to find uh, energy auditors from uh, slima sri lanka energy managers association so we made use of uh, these uh, experts and we identified areas that we uh, have to improve so first uh, thing uh, we observed is uh, the most of the fans which we use to deliver air in most of our application are all uh, either non standard uh, or overrated etc so what we did was all we standardized all the uh, fan settings uh, you know there's a fan low when the power is increased by uh, two the power consumption goes by eight times so when the same thing happens when you reduce the speed or reduce the airflow so it gives us a very good uh, energy uh, saving so and again uh, for the same application we use the plc and inverter control system to control the speed and if you regulate the speed wherever necessary and at the uh, different different points of the uh, processing so that also gave us a considerable amount of uh, energy saving though the cost is a little implementation cost is little high but it, the overall it gives gave us a very good uh, return so the third one we did uh, because the cost of the plc units are high we did uh, uh, innovation on our own uh, to rewind uh, our some of our motors to run on two speed uh, system so so that also gave us a very good uh, result at very low cost 
and uh, other thing is most of our uh, dryers or any other unit where we use heated air has a lot of uh, problems with air leak and uh, heat leaks. So what we did was we uh, rectified all these uh, air leaks in our machinery and uh, whatever the insulations uh, we improved to improve the uh, electrical and thermal energy to of course it helped the thermal energy uh, well. And uh, uh, some of our uh, key machinery, uh, actually it's called a withering unit. Uh, it's, it's also a dryer, basically it's also a dryer. The airflow patterns underneath the flatbed is not even, actually it's applicable to the flatbed uh, dryers that we use in the other spice and other industries, service industries as well. The airflow patterns uh, underneath the bed, are not even, so it gives us very uneven drying. So we uh, did a lot of uh, plotting across uh, the beds and uh, plotted against uh, the land and observed that the airflow distribution among uh, the tough units are not even. So we introduced, we did some research and trial and errors and introduced some baffles inside the uh, tough bed to smoothen up uh, the systems and that also helped us a lot of, uh, of uh, saving energy plus getting an even dry product. And uh, the, the same uh, withering process, same drying process, uh, actually this experience we are shared from our friends in uh, Kenya tea uh, industry. Uh, they did a very good uh, project. Mr. Sunil, yeah. Yes, okay, uh, uh, disruption, sorry for that. Uh, withering, uh, withering system has two uh, systems of withering, that is uh, chemical withering and physical withering. So, for the chemical withering, you need at least 12 hours and balance for the physical withering. Normally in our tough systems or withering drying system, what we do is from the beginning to the end, we run a fan at a huge amount of electricity cost or consumption. But the Kenyans studied this uh, properly and they split this into chemical and physical withering and they allowed first 12 hours for chemical withering in a very controlled environment with a mild air flow, 100% saturated. And after the chemical withering, they gave the balance for hours high speed air flow at, for physical withering, which saved nearly 60% of the energy savings uh, in the uh, industry. And uh, most of, uh, actually, I don't know whether that is uh, still running uh, in factories. Most of our old uh, traditional factories. Hello? Hello? Most of the uh, traditional factories on group uh, electrical motors. That means one motor connected at the end of the factory through shaft it runs all the machinery. So what we did was we, uh, we decentralized all the power systems and fitted individual motors. And that also helped us a lot uh, to gain a lot of energy savings. And uh, one uh, most important uh, thing applicable to everybody is the capacitor banks available in uh, the factories, which controls the KVA demand. At the moment, I, I think it's per thousand rupees per KVA demand is being charged by the electricity board. And uh, in most of the factories, we don't have a capacitor bank. We have to pay a colossal amount of money for the KVA charge. So what we did was we installed capacitor banks where possible and we rehabilitate and refurbish the existing ones and improve the existing ones so that uh, the KVA demand was reduced 
and the colossal amount of money uh, was saved. And another important uh, factor is the maintenance of uh, machinery. Proper maintenance also helps a lot to save the electricity and other maintenance uh, so cost, etc. The smooth running makes savings. And uh, very familiar thing that we change all our traditional uh, lighting system into LED and CFS. Of course, now it is all LED and we uh, reduce the cost of electrical energy uh, drastically. And uh, most of the uh, traditional uh, places, we had uh, all the uh, estate uh, outhouses being subcated through the factories. We disconnected all the lines connected it to the CEB and gave limited number of units to the consumers and balance on their uh, account. And this also helped for the survival of the uh, factory uh, level cost of production was reduced. And another thing is we provided very uh, regular training for the technicians and the staff people for better maintenance, better power controls of the factory because if there is an idling bulb, this has to be switched off. If there is an idling motor, it has to be switched off. So this discipline helped us a lot to improve the energy, uh, electrical energy uh, efficiency in the factory. Also the uh, maintaining discipline in the switchboard, motor services with the schedule, this was uh, nicely carried out and uh, that also helped us a lot to improve the uh, electrical energy uh, efficiencies. And one thing, uh, though there are capacitor banks to control the KVA demand, switching the big motors one by one helped us a lot because when the motor is switched, it uh, draws a huge current and the KVA demand goes up. So if you switch on two motors at the same time, you have a huge spike and big KVA reading recorded on the meter. So one, one, if you switch on one by one, that will help drastically to uh, reduce the electrical uh, energy costs. So on the uh, thermal energy saving uh, pattern, which is mostly useful today's uh, crisis situation, only thing is, uh, the first thing that we did was minimizing the waste stages. So all the possible areas in the uh, machinery where heat is being utilized was properly insulated and all the leaks were prevented and maintained in a proper. So maintenance of this machinery and the furnaces makes a huge sense in saving thermal energy. And uh, when, when the waste heat is at a certain level where the humidity is less, probably the latter part of the drying process, the waste leak to be recovered using a heat exchange or sometimes directly. We introduce direct and heat exchange, uh, heat uh, process heat uh, recovery system to improve the uh, heat energy utilization. Also, we introduce uh, flue gas recovery because after the dryer, the chimney you get sometimes you get high temperatures so we introduce heat recovery flue gas heat recovery system to improve the system efficiencies and uh, introduce the combustion air controlling system sensing the uh, temperatures where we have anything at that time so we introduce those systems uh, to control the combustion that it saves energy saves a lot of uh, time, everything, and the quality of the product too went up. And also, as I told earlier, uh, standardizing all the airflow systems in the uh, dryers and other machinery, and uh, redesigning the transformation ducting to obtain the uh, laminar smooth flows, so making uh, even drying. Even drying is again uh, saving a lot of money because you have to you have the hassle of redrying a lot of uneven products. So it saved a lot of money 
uh, by uh, smoothing, making it a laminar flow, uh, etc. And uh, uh, we had very uh, low efficient, very traditional uh, heaters in most of the places. We replaced those with either new ones or with uh, steam or hot water uh, boilers in the uh, latter stage. Uh, and we had few uh, furnace oil uh, fired heaters. We converted those things into firewood, paddy husk, and sawdust, which gave us very uh, considerable amount of space. But, but uh, in the latter part uh, of the uh, business, the paddy husk demand and the sawdust demand was so high. And it went out of stock. So again, we had to convert certain uh, boilers or certain furnaces back into kerosene. Now, of course, uh, now we, we are in the, in the uh, argument whether we going back there or not. There's no option, of course, there's no kerosene. And we have to go for either wood or padihas or sawdust again. In some previous state, they have their own firewood, so they are uh, they are okay because there's a rule. Actually, uh, one fourth of the hectare age under cultivation has to go on poor wood. They had that concept uh, from the uh, good old days, so they are of course very safe at the moment. And uh, another thing is, uh, if you use uh, firewood in the factory, seasoning of firewood is also very, very uh, important. Uh, seasoning of the uh, firewood is very, very important where we have to bring down the moisture content below 20 for proper uh, energy uh, utilization and combustion. So we did three months stock, maintain three months stock, well uh, cut, well split it, then well spat. For, for the natural drying. Of course, this is a cumbersome operation for uh, other uh, food processors, but these states, they have all organized in the uh, system, but it's a cum uh, cumbersome operation for others to do. But still, uh, if somebody is willing to convert, they must rethink, as Professor Dharma said, at all whether the uh, things are available in uh, their area and they have sufficient space for the storage of firewood and other biomass, whatever the biomass, whether it's uh, sawdust or uh, or firewood, you have a huge storage, you have to have a huge storage facility if you are to run on these biomass systems. That is uh, a negative point for SIC for the new uh, people who are willing to enter into the uh, new biomass uh, systems. And now uh, well, some places we use uh, waste heat uh, from the furnace, that is flu, waste flu uh, to use uh, to dry uh, firewood in a very short period because during rainy season, we have a lot of uh, problems getting uh, the wood dried. So that helped us a lot uh, getting quicker uh, drying of uh, firewood as well. And of course, uh, again, as I told, uh, the training and the discipline that has to be maintained in this particular area is also very important. Where we introduced uh, weighing systems at the uh, furnace stroke level. We have to weigh firewood and record it and feed into the dryer. And at the end of the day, we know how many kilograms are utilized. And it, of course, allowed us to uh, allowed us to compare the day to day. Uh, full wood consumption, and if there's something goes wrong, the unit consumption goes wrong, we, we have the chance of probing uh, whether the firewood is well seasoned, well fed, or uh, any uh, mis uh, misconduct was uh, taken place, etc. etc. Uh, and uh, most of our state bungalows had uh, a cooker called Raven cooker, which is used. Firewood for all the needs like cooking or water boiling, 
hot water for the showroom, uh, bathrooms, etc., etc., and uh, there's an oven, etc. And this was uh, abundant. So under the uh, uh, sustainable uh, program, we rehabilitate some of uh, the Raymond Cookers. Of course, a lot of objections came from the users because since gas, LP gas is available, we need not to go back and not to uh, put a step uh, backward. But of course, those people must be appreciating us for initiating that program because the problem of LP gas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, any other uh, actions we have taken to reduce the cost, overall cost, but not only the energy cost, uh, uh, like labor cost, et cetera. We uh, did a lot of studies in the processes and unit operation, and we recycled all the machinery, conveyorized all the machinery to bring down the uh, labor cost and other things. And uh, other area that is the main yeah, Mr. Sunil, sorry for the disturbance. Please go ahead. You are muted. Ah, right now, right. Okay, madam. Okay, madam. Uh, one thing, another uh, area that has been touched because we were a large organization, we had about uh, uh, 23 factories and uh, altogether 16,000 hectares. So a uh, lot of people, lot of factories, sort of involvement. So we de designed our own uh, engineering unit in the company. And we started doing all the maintenance and we started fabricating locally our own machinery for the industry, whatever the possible uh, machinery. Actually, uh, some machineries we had to import like color sorter, yeah, we didn't have the technology. Uh, other than the color sorter, we fabricated all the machinery. Uh, with the, with sometimes with the help outsourced for the experts in the area. Uh, and uh, we brought down the cost by in-house uh, developing all the uh, facilities. Mm. And uh, that's all I have to share. Maybe a uh, few points uh, useful for different different processing uh, units and food processors and uh, just uh, we can uh, still uh, refine whatever the ideas we gave and introduce into your uh, industries and make your industries survival thank you very much for being patient with me thank you again. thank you mr sunil for a very you know the practical uh, uh, solutions and also sharing your long experience. I am very sure the, the audience got a lot of points from your speech. So now the floor is open for questions. And I, I must uh, say that you, you are free to use any language, De definitely maybe not Tamil. So English uh -huh. or Sinhala. <laughs> so everyone is free to ask questions uh, using a language comfortable to you. Hello, sir. Uh, can you explain me the chemical weathering of the tea leaves? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, actually, yes, yes. The chemical uh, weathering uh, starts from the time you pluck uh, the leaf from the tree, uh, bush. So chemical weathering uh, converts some amino acid into uh, some useful uh, uh, chemical compounds like chiroflavins, uh, chiroflavins, Etc. So there's a ratio that you have to build up zero beginning to zero flavings to one to uh, twelve uh, ratio. This takes uh, for eight to ten hours after plugging. So yes. if you allow eight hours or ten hours in a very uh, controlled environment, like it should not dry, it should not uh, dry at that time. It should be given a very mild level of airflow with 100% saturated so that you, are, you ensure no drying takes place. If you dry, you make the concentration different and uh, change the thero begin to thero flaming uh, ratio different. So we allow that for uh, 10 hours in a very controlled environment to take place the uh, chemical withering. After that, you are free. Once the total chemical change has been taken, you are free to do physical withering in a very quick time. 
So I was talking on the energy saving part, but this is the uh, chemical measuring part of that. Right. Hope it is clear to you. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a question in the chat box, uh, chat box uh, Mr. Sunil. Yes. Uh, can I know what are machinery? Uh, okay, Mr. Sunil, fabricate locally. Uh, uh, we, uh, we fabricate a uh, lot of uh, machinery uh, for the food industry. Actually, it's on uh, demand, on request. We do, we can design uh, any machinery uh, with the available uh, resources in the country at the moment. Uh, now we do a lot of uh, spice processing machinery. Big orders, of course, these days we are getting uh, the steamers, the washers, the slicers, the dryers, uh, the grinders, the polishers etc. There, there's a demand for the packing machine, but we don't do that. We, of course, outsource and supply if there's a, a request. So, but we can design uh, any machinery uh, because we are, but we are very uh, willing to do what we have already designed because we are doing a business here. If there's a research component, if somebody is willing to do, willing to uh, fund for a research, we are always open. Actually, this, though there's a problem with this uh, crisis, I see a silver line here because a lot of people are now willing to buy local uh, machinery. As uh, Professor Dharma said, told, nothing impossible, nothing is plucked from trees, all are fabricated, designed, and fabricated by human beings. So we are, we are willing to help uh, people uh, to meet their requirements locally. Uh, Mr. Sunil, there is one other question in the chat box. Yes. Please explain the benefit of using hot water boiler than a superheated steam for some processing industries. Yeah, that depends on uh, your application heat requirement. If it is low requirement, of course, hot water is the best because it gives you a lot of efficiency. But if it is a very high temperature requirement, we want to go superheated, but still uh, we can go uh, at a steam at with higher pressures, so that will consume because there's a latent heat and uh, uh, sensitive heat difference, which is uh, which is of course uh, a big difference in that too. With hot water boilers, you have to give mostly the uh, sensible heat, but the latent heat is very expensive, so that is the difference. Any other questions or even comments are encouraged? Okay, if not, uh, thank you uh, so much, Mr. Sunil, for your very practical speech. I think it's really important for us, especially for the food industry in Sri Lanka at this crisis situation. Thank you. And thank let's you. move on to the, the, the last speaker, fifth speaker, Mr. Kapila Viratunga. He's an engineer, uh, obtained his BSc engineering in the field of chemical engineering and an MPhil in the field of mechanical engineering, both from the University of Peradeniya. He was a former lecturer attached to Department of Agricultural Engineering, University of Rohuna. He holds uh, several patents for his inventions in the field and also serves as a social entrepreneur. Currently, he is serving as the managing partner and general manager at Sabiru Technologies and Services, the premier dryer dehydrator manufacturer in the country. He also operates a dehydration technology center together with a model processing center at Ukwela, Mathale. Uh, Mr. Kapila, over to you. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Kapila, we can yeah. hear you. <clears throat> now, can I also share my slides now? Yeah, please do that. We have given the option. All right. Now. Hello? 
Yes, uh, Mr. Kapila, you can go to the yes. Now, okay. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Well, at the, at the outset, I have to tell you that my connection isn't uh, very stable at times. So please uh, excuse me if, it, you know, uh, if, you, if there's a breaks uh, in between. Uh, please bear with me. And uh, first, uh, the Institute of uh, Food Science and Technology, Sri Lanka, and uh, President uh, Professor Iresha for inviting us to share our experience at this uh, crisis uh, you know, moment in the country. And I hope uh, the, the contributions that we make will finally uh, you know, uh, contribute to make things better for the country, hopefully. Yeah, so um, now uh, uh, I want to, uh, you know, uh, base uh, this presentation uh, on my uh, experience uh, in the field of uh, drying or dehydration technologies. Uh, and uh, so in the, in the presentation, uh, we will uh, talk about uh, my experience, but uh, uh, as we all know, uh, you know, in most of the food industries, uh, drying or dehydration uh, is is an uh, essential part of uh, processing, especially in food processing as well as in agro processing. And uh, uh, also, you have to you will you will agree that uh, dryers uh, they gasol energy. You know, they use large amounts of fuel. And uh, now, we, since you know we are we are very actively engaged in this uh, field. We know that there are a lot of industries who have either gone out of operation of these dryers due to fuel shortages. And, uh, uh, you know, we can see that uh, the, this shortage of fuel have, uh, shortages have severely affected the dry operations in many, many ways. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we have also witnessed that a lot of, uh, uh, you know, agro and food, uh, you know, uh, products have, be, have gone to waste due to this problem. And um, so uh, I will uh, talk about uh, the, the drying and dehydration technologies and uh, what options that will be available for uh, you know, thermal gener energy generation part. Uh, you know, since, since we are faced with this uh, fuel shortage now and uh, so this, uh, my experience in the last 20 years in the dryer design and manufacture, as well as uh, the dry operations and also my, uh, you know, uh, innovations, uh, I, I uh, you know, will draw from those experience in my last 20 years. Um, now, uh, to make uh, a certain points uh, very clear at the beginning, I, I just want you know, uh, start with a, a hot air batch dryer, uh, which is a typical operation in most of these industries, and then uh, get understanding, you know, uh, of, of uh, the kind of energy that we are talking about here, right? So uh, I have taken this uh, conservative, uh, you know, uh, example of operation of, of a uh, hot air batch dryer, which will uh, say dry 50 kilograms 500, sorry, 500 kilograms of wet material, uh, giving 100 kilograms of dry material uh, at the end, right? Which means that uh, there will be 400 uh, kilos of water removed during this dry period. And uh, we will take this as a, again, a 10 hour dry cycle, right? And um, you can see also there's a little, uh, graph on the, on the right, which shows that, uh, it shows the drying rate, how, how the drying rate uh, changes with time. So by drying rate, what we mean is the rate of uh, moisture removal from the dryer uh, and how that rate changes with the time. Uh, so initially, of course, uh, moisture is removed at a higher rate and uh, this rate reduces gradually towards the end of the dry period. Okay. And this is also important uh, to, to uh, understand this, this, this fact uh, because uh, uh, most of the dryers, uh, the, the, the thermal energy requirements you know, also change with time. Now, uh, 
uh, if you just take this uh, example of you know 400 kilos of water being removed in 10 hour dry period uh, so you get average rate of 14 40 four, zero, 4 kilograms of water removed per hour uh, but you see the initial rate is much higher right so we, we again take uh, a conservative estimate of about 250 percent above the average rate so which comes to about 100 kilograms of water removed per hour right and then we also have to note that this each kilogram of this water uh, removed as steam you know, as water vapor uh, requires uh, 2.3 megajoules of thermal energy or 2300 kilojoules of thermal energy and uh, this uh, total removal of uh, 400 kilograms of water uh, it uh, it requires a thermal energy input of 920 megajoules of net energy or if you talk about allowing for inefficiencies in the, uh, in, the in the you know hot air generator part of it uh, it will be about 1300 megajoules from fuel and this will be equivalent to 40 liters of petroleum oil or 570 kilograms of steel or 365 kilowatt hours of electricity right so you can appreciate uh, the, the the numbers that we are talking about here uh, also you can get a feel for the amount of energy uh, heat energy that we are talking about hello Iresha, can you is my stream clear now it's very clear uh, mr kapila go ahead please yeah okay right okay thank you uh then uh, again uh, as as we mentioned earlier now let's let's consider this rate of drying and also the rate of heat supply i mean that is what matters finally okay so if you talk about the average rate of 40 kilograms of steam per hour that means 36 kilowatt of average heating rate right that's a gross rate it's again allowing for the inefficiencies then if you consider this maximum rate of 100 kilograms of steam per hour uh, that means 90 kilowatt of uh, you know heat supply rate gross again now uh, with the you know uh, with this challenge of uh, you know fuel shortages a lot of people you know dry owners have asked me can't we you know switch to electrical heat you know we got electricity at least uh, uh, you know some hours of the day or most hours of the, of the day so can we uh, can't we you know switch to electrical heat and of course uh, and there have been also people offering these services you know of, uh, you know of offering uh, uh, to fix electric heaters, you know, to overcome the problem of fuel shape, shortage. Now, let us uh, let us understand the situation and see if it is a wise decision. Now, uh, we were talking about you know, in the earlier slide. Uh, now, you are next. Uh, you need the average rate uh, rate of thirty six kilowatt of uh, heating, and initially in the in the beginning, you need of ninety kilowatts of heating right now if you uh, uh, you know most of the industries of course have industrial uh, uh, electrical supply connections and uh, a common one is of course 30 ampere three phase connection and that can only supply 20 kilowatts of uh, power right whether you use it for water drives or, or whether you use it for uh, heating now our requirement is 90 kilowatts now so you can see even for this particular dryer, which is a you know a middle mid sized dryer, uh, you know your electrical supply even from a sixty ampere three phase connection is quite uh, not adequate, right? And again, and this electricity is again you know it's, it's a very expensive and a very valuable source of energy. So so it's not a wise idea to convert uh, uh, you know you you uh, fuel heating, you know, fuel-based heating to electrical heating. But then there is, uh, of course, uh, other option, you know, and uh, Professor Sanat Tamar to touch up on this, uh, and that is the heat pumps, which is uh, becoming very popular now in the country. Of course, uh, in the heat pumps, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it runs on a system which is very 
similar to what you uh, get in an air conditioning system or a refrigeration system, right? Uh, consisting of a compressor, uh, evapor evaporator, uh, or what you call a cooling point, and a condenser, or what you call a condenser coil, right? Uh, so in this case, uh, uh, our, our major objective is to supply heat to the drive process. So uh, with uh, 20 kilowatt of electrical input to the compressor, you know, you can supply 55 kilowatt of heating to the drive, right? So the, in other words, uh, uh, there'll be more than 275% of uh, en energy gain, you know, energy gain when you use a heat pump. Right? So that, that, that becomes feasible, uh, you know, to use heat pumps running on electrical, electrical supply to heat dryers. And uh, because there is this energy gain, you know, uh, of course, uh, your cost of operations are also not going to be severely affected. Okay. So uh, a basic arrangement of a heat pump dryer be like this. Uh, now, of course, there are uh, two different, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, designs. Basically, one is a closed cycle uh, heat pump operation, and the other one is the uh, open cycle uh, heat pump operation. Uh, of course, for larger industrial uh, applications, uh, open cycle heat pump operation is, uh, you know, more suitable, and that is what I have shown here. So. Uh, uh, on the left, uh, the, the, the heat pump uh, is doing exactly the job that's done that by an oil-fired air heater, right? So uh, uh, this is a tray dryer, of course, so the, the trolley is, uh, and, uh, and the AI stream, right, is of course has uh, this uh, air resolution capabilities here, and, uh, and the, the return air from the dryer you know, goes to the uh, condenser or the heater and enters the dry, right? And uh, part of the uh, return air is, of course, recently, right? So this is the arrangement, basically. Uh, now, uh, we have been operating this kind of dryers uh, in our process center as well as so we have supplied this kind of dryers to industry. Now, I, I just show you uh, two examples here. Uh, this is a heat pump unit, which is uh, operating on uh, open site, right? And uh, sub, uh, can, uh, you know, coupled to a tray dryer in, in this, uh, on my right, and also connected to a flatbed bulk type dryer, right? Now, in fact, this, uh, the, the bulk dryer, flatbed type bulk dryer on the, on, on the left, uh, it has been running on oil in my process center. But since we are also facing the same problem as you are, due to shortage of uh, fuel, we, uh, we removed the you know, oil-fired air heater and fix the heat pump, right? So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple switch over. Uh, but of course, uh, investment-wise, heat pumps are much more expensive than uh, oil-fired air heating units. Uh, but uh, because uh, you get uh, energy gain, you know, uh, and then uh, you mix it uses economical in this, you know, in this case. Uh, and of course, the next one would be for solutions uh, to the fuel, you know, shortage. It will be uh, also feasible to go for wood fire dryers, right? And uh, in this slide, of course, I have uh, shown uh, two types of dryers that we, we have designed and uh, installed. Uh, so here, of course, in the in the picture on the, on the left, this is again a bulk type uh, flatbed type dryer, you know, coupled to a very simple uh, grate fired wood stove, and uh, and it's uh, directly coupled to the dryer, right? So that way, of course, we keep the uh, investments low, but of course. Uh, uh, and of course, this unit again in this unit we have replaced the oil fired unit with a simple wood fired 
uh, stop. Right? But then uh, one short, uh, you know, shortcoming in this dry is that you have to control the dry, dry temperature by uh, manual fuel feeding. But of course, uh, it's not uh, that difficult at the end. Uh, now, when we operate, of course, we uh, load the uh, stove uh, twice every hour. And that way you can maintain uh, constant temperature levels in the dryer. Uh, and of course, you can see uh, the fuel is the simple uh, fuel wood that you buy uh, the market by the yards. You know, or, or to be your own fuel from the uh, or, or, or the fuel you buy from uh, timber mills, right? And of course, um, on my uh, right top is a, is a five ton capacity large. Uh, flat bed dryer, bulk dryer, again uh, coupled to four wood stoves, you know, and then uh, air heaters. So this, uh, you know, and then we have been uh, doing this for the last uh, 10 years or so, you know, making, uh, fabricating and, and, and installing wood fire dryers. But of course, uh, the interest way, you know, last uh, five years or so, because uh, there was kerosene available at very low. Uh, price at very low, very subsidized prices. So people uh, were moving from away from wood fuel to uh, kerosene fuel. But now the trend is reversed. Now people are now coming back, and then uh, you know looking at this fuel wood option again. Of course, uh, the second option, uh, if you are interested in uh, you know using uh, wood fuel, is to go for uh, small steam boilers. Now, of course here what you see is a vertical type uh, 250 kilogram per hour steam boiler to fire. Um, but of course this in this case uh, compared to the dryer the boiler is going to be also a sizable investment. Uh, this is a disadvantage but uh, in this case of course automatic temp dryer you know dryer temperature Control the temperature can be controlled automatically by uh, you know steam uh, control of steam. So these are the options that we can uh, practically think of now among them. You know, of course, there will be few other options, but these are becoming popular now in the industry, and uh, we also have gained a lot of experience in this. So uh, that is what I have to share with you, uh, and I would be uh, happy to you know, answer your, your questions and concerns and give sound advice, you know, if, uh, if possible. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kapila. It was a very educative uh, type of uh, a speech. I think it's really important for the, the food industry to have the involvement of uh, people like you. So, I think... Uh, uh, even in the uh, now, now, Iresha, just, just one more thing I would like to add, you know. Yes, now, yes. Uh, as you, you know, said in, in, in the introduction, uh, now we have been operating a, a dehydration technology center, you know, uh, you know with, along with our dry manufacturing facility in Equila. And um, so, they, of course, uh, we, we, we are using uh, about eight, nine different kinds of dryers that we manufacture here. And, uh, and then uh, what we are doing is, of course, uh, dry you know uh, for other clients as well and uh, and uh, we, we have sort of large uh, capacity for dry cook, drying as well as uh, uh, drying of agro crops you know agriculture crops uh, uh, and uh, recently there has been a demand you know from the locality that we, we you know from our own locality for dehydration of you know for is like that food red food and you know whatever that they, they define in the, in the village uh, and then we have facilitated that you know so they bring their staff uh, you know uh, processed uh, say uh, processed uh, jack food and they they use our drives you know? so uh, that, that that model you know where we 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 have uh, you know localized uh, processing centers food processing centers i think uh, is, is a good uh, you know initiative to, uh, to look at you know, as an institute because you know all over the country there are a lot of uh, unutilized crops and there's a lot of food uh, you know going to waste due to uh, post harvest uh, you know handling and, and, and 
and various seasonal availabilities and so on. So this is, uh, and, and, and as you know, the losses are even going up to 50%. These are not just, uh, you know, cereal crops, cereal crops uh, and, and uh, vegetables, fruits, you know. So it's a huge, uh, even now, it's now it's happening. So we talk about the, uh, you know, food crisis in the country. There's a lot of uh, food going to waste right now. Uh, but this kind of central, you know, I'm not saying these are huge but uh, uh, basic dehydration facilities, maybe, you, you know, even canning facilities, basic facilities at, a, at, at centralized locations, you know, in, in different places would be very uh, helpful uh, and, and, and a practical solutions, you know, to think of. Yes, definitely, Mr. Kapila. Now, actually, there are direct request in the chat box uh, requesting your contact details. I already provided all uh, for the contact details of all five speakers. And uh, I think uh, if you, uh, the, the, the forum is open for questions uh, from uh, Mr. Kapila. Any questions from the audience? Mr. Kapila, you can unshare your uh, slides. Okay, sure. And then we can see you. Yeah, okay, hi. Right. Any questions from the audience? Any clarifications? And he, he already mentioned the, the services that the, his company is offering. So if there is any need, definitely you can contact Mr. Kapila and also Mr. The Sunil. Both are very the practical uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, I mean, providing services to uh, practical solutions, uh, practical, uh, I mean, problems. So any question to him? As I said, I mean, you can use any language, uh, Sinhala or English, to ask questions. Dr. Resha? Yes. Yeah, the, actually, this is not a question, it's a comment. Uh, I wanted to add some more things to what he has suggested, the common processing centers. I think it's a timely need to the country now. So if uh, we are trying to set up that type of processing centers, it should be PP, public private partnership. Otherwise it's really difficult to maintain and sustainability also we have to uh, secure. So therefore I think uh, we can introduce that type of things because a lot of people like even cottage industry people, they want some kind of facility to uh, use whatever the excess they have for their home use. So I think uh, we can think uh, about that uh, suggestion. Yes, uh, Dr. Ilmi, I think it's a very uh, important uh, suggestion. I think there may be some uh, the private companies who are willing to, uh, I mean, uh, provide resources in yes. this uh, aspect. So even the universities, uh, there are people who can uh, provide their uh, the expertise so definitely uh, this time we are in a crisis so we all should uh, come together uh, to uh, solve issues otherwise i don't know where we will be ending so that is very true uh, dr ilmi thank you so much for your suggestion so any comments i see you are waiting to comment maybe professor upali samarajiva sir okay yes. thank you professor mendes uh, i was waiting to make uh, an observation and a comment. Let me first thank each and every speaker individually and collectively for the excellent presentations and also bringing out to us, to the country, to the people, the hidden talents, the hidden knowledge and hidden possibilities that are there for us to use. Now in this situation, I know already there are various industries struggling because of the current situation in the country. Most of these industries, as I see, they need individual attention. So we need to have a mechanism to provide individual attention to these industries. It may, be, it may not be possible for you all to visit the industries in the light of all these shortages, but still, there's the possibility of somebody using a WhatsApp uh, 
and observing what is happening in an industry. I have been doing it with labs in Sri Lanka from Canada. Uh, you may be able to give some guidance and also understand what their problems and try to give some kind of solutions to them. So in this situation, I think it's very important for the Sri Lanka Food Process Association to identify their own industrialists who need this attention and bring them to the IFSTSL so that we could put those groups or people together and provide the best use for them. In this process, I think we cannot go through the governments and officers and individuals, in, uh, that kind of things, because there are a lot of uh, problems as I already have experienced. So it's very important that we get this team, the team that spoke today, to contact through us or through SLFPA, the individual industries who are in need of this. So we may have to even request for, a, for them to give us uh, what, we, what they want. Now this might, you know, as I see the, the current problems will go for at least three years, if not more. So there's definite need for us to change from the more sophisticated approach we had all these days into a more practical approach which could be used in the current context. So with that observations, I would like to again thank everybody and especially Professor Iresha Mendes for organizing this excellent program, which is very timely. Thank you all. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now it's time now even uh, all five speakers are still with us. If you have any other question to pose them, so it's possible. Any questions or general comments? And as uh, Professor Samrajiva very correctly said, the Institute of Food Science and Technology, we are giving a lot of services to the, especially to the food industry uh, in terms of training programs mostly. So you all are welcome at any time. I even uh, uh, included all the contact details. So if you need any tailor-made sort of training programs, you are welcome to contact us anytime. So we are ready to serve you, especially during this crisis situation. And not only from the, the, the people who are the members of uh, the IFSTSL, we will connect the relevant personnel who are having the knowledge, who are, I mean, having the capacity to serve in a particular purpose. So we are in a position to do that. So you all are welcome to contact us anytime. And I have included the, the website of IFSTSL as well. So go through it and we have done we have done a lot of work in the, the field, especially in the food sector from 2011. So go through it and if any, any person who is willing to become a member of IFSTSL, also welcome. So if there are no other questions, let me invite Ms. Anjali Omalka uh, to uh, propose official vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Madam. Uh, greetings to all of you. On behalf of IFSTSL, I would uh, like to propose a hearty word of thanks to all our resource persons, Professor K.S.P. Amaratunga, Dr. Jatal Mana Peruma, Professor D.A. Nimal Dharmasena, Mr. Sunil Basnayaka, uh, Mr. Kapila Viratunga Arachi for gracing today's interactive session. Thank you all for sharing your words of wisdom. I'm sure that all the participants today have taken note of your explanations, your suggestions, and will be discussing within their organizations and within their companies. I would also like to pay my heartiest gratitude to all the participants present today, especially representing the food processing sector. Also, I highly appreciate Mrs. Sunanda Virasingha for initiating a discussion with the IFSTSL Exco members to identify potential functions to support the current crisis situation, especially in the food sector. Thank you very much for the support of Mr. Tusit Singh and also the other members of SLFPA committee members for cooperating to organize this event. Last but not least, on behalf of IFSTSL, I'm very thankful to the coordinator of today's event who also moderated the event none other than the president of IFSTSL, Professor Iresha Mendes, and the entire IFSL, IFSTSL team for their valuable thoughts, 
on activities organized by IFSDSL. Once again, thanks to all the people who helped, helped us either directly or indirectly to make this event a success. So thank you very much uh, for your nice participation. And also we would like to see you all in our future upcoming uh, webinars and also the other events. Thank you very much for your nice participation.